Joining us now to talk about some of the demographic changes in this country and the way that Republicans have been peeling off Latino voters from Democrats is a great friend of mine, Justin Guest. He is a professor of policy and government at the Schar School at George Mason University. Great to see you, my friend. Good to see you, man. Good to be with you. Um, so there's a lot I want to get to, but first of all, you've done a lot of research on demographic shifts in this country, in countries around the world, how that's worked out for political systems, both in ways good and bad. Um, and it's given you some particular insight into the trouble that Democrats are having with Latinos right now. So just break a little bit of that down for us. Sure. Well, the United States has been trending in the direction that we see of other majority minority states around the world, uh, where you see a lot of minority groups growing in number. You often see the racialization of politics. And we are beginning to see the U.S. trending in that direction over the last two decades, where what I, racial or ethnic identity you are often is predicting or more predicting of your political choices. But that's starting to change in an interesting way right now because recently there have been a number of polls that are showing that Latinos are actually beginning to marginally move closer towards the Republican Party, whereas before they were almost a two-third, one-third split, a uh, two-to-one split uh, towards Democrats. And that was something that was true for other minority groups and remains true, in some cases even more extreme. Uh, but Latinos are moving closer and closer towards a more even split to the Republican Party uh, in a way that we haven't seen really since George W. Bush in 2004. So let's track it then in terms of history, and that's what you write about in the book. How does that track with recent arrivals to the United States in the 1900s? How long does that transition away from ethnic voting bloc to kind of uh, a total assimilation into normal American politics take? Well, in some cases, it never really goes away. Okay. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of times parties make a bond with a particular mm -hmm. minority group or or other identity group, and that bond lasts a very long time. You know, we see that today with a lot of Cuban Americans and the right. Republican that's Party, um, and that's just true in general. Um, so there's no real sort of broad rule necessarily, um, but certainly when a, a minority group, when an immigrant group begins to vote not as that identity group, not as an Irish person or an Italian person or a Catholic person, but just you know as a sort of everyday American or finds another form of identity, whether it's a white racial identity or perhaps a professional identity, you know, as an attorney or as mm -hmm. a union member, that's when you really start to see what you might call assimilation because they have dropped what had made them distinct and different before and have, have taken on a different identity. Yeah. And by the way, guys, the book is called Majority Minority. That's why yes. we <laughs> mentioned yeah. that a couple right. of times. Um, we can go ahead and put that book jacket up on the screen and highly recommend it to all of you. Um, so this is particularly noteworthy because it's the opposite of predictions that were being made, both by the Democratic Party that had this idea of the coalition of the ascendant and these demographic changes in the country were just going to, like, guarantee their political power forever. And now they're in a situation where they're facing down likely significant losses in the midterms. Biden looks extraordinarily weak for re-election. Of course, you never want to outright bet against an incumbent president. And the other piece of this is specifically with Donald Trump because his rhetoric was so inflammatory with regards to immigration, he had such a hardline hawkish view, especially in the 2016 election, all of the pundits were predicting, oh, there's gonna be historic margins among Latinos for Democrats. And in fact, not only have we not seen that, but Trump improved again his, you know, his stand with Latinos in the 2020 election. We see poll after poll that in the midterms, Latinos may sort of split their vote 50-50 between Democrats and Republicans. So what has triggered this shift right now at this time, do you think? So many people think it's that Latinos are looking differently at U.S. political parties. But what I would argue is that actually Latinos are looking differently at themselves. They see themselves through a different prism. Not necessarily, or actually, and by the way, we shouldn't be generalizing across all Latinos, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Yeah. But those who are shifting their votes in particular, we can generalize a little bit more about. We're seeing them in pockets of the country like South Texas, South Florida. You have a lot of Americans there who actually self-identify as white Hispanics. So in the census, you know, we, you're asked your ethnicity, whether you're Hispanic or not Hispanic, and then you're asked your race, white, black, Asian American, Native Pacific Islander, et cetera. Um, in this case, you have a lot of Latinos who also identify as white. And that white identity may be superseding their sense of Latino solidarity. In many cases, like the parts of South Texas, the borderlands of the country, many of those are, are, are people of Mexican origin who never actually necessarily migrate to the United States. The old saying there is, I didn't cross the border, mm -hmm. the border crossed me, yeah. mm. right? So they're historic Tejanos who have actually always lived in that part of Texas, 
back when it was actually part of Mexico. Now, that's not the majority group, but there is a sense that they are different because of the many generations that they've been in the United States from the immigrants who are recently arriving from Latin America and elsewhere. Yeah, so how does that trend then for our politics moving forward? So there's a there's a couple of ways it can go, right? Which is that increasing identity politics makes white people rediscover or reignite identity politics. That's probably not good for everybody involved. <laughs> uh, the other way that it goes is that generally kind of how I see things, everything breaks down more along class lines as we move forward with assimilation. It's even with high levels of immigration. Which way of those trend lines do you think it'll go? Well, I can tell you the, the way we yeah. want things to go right. is not that this is the politics of whiteness right. and Latinos are just assimilating into an understanding of whiteness that is sure. somehow nationalistic and exclusive of other cultures. What we hope is that the Republican Party is actually making a concerted appeal mm -hmm. to people of minority backgrounds and to Latinos in particular to create this change. Now, from my observations, I'm not seeing that appeal. I'm not seeing that concerted effort to bring in Latinos necessarily. What I'm seeing is more the sort of broadening of the politics of whiteness to reach the next most quote unquote assimilable group. And I think that's problematic actually for US politics going forward. So let's broaden out because the book focuses on, okay, there have been other countries and other places where you had a group that was previously in the majority that becomes then in the minority. Right. How does that typically go? Yeah, so it's a mix of conflict and coexistence. And different countries have different experiences uh, based on a variety of things that I write about in the book quite extensively. Um, I say six different countries, and they are so different. Uh, one thing they all have in common, aside from the fact that they're all islands, because they're very fragile demographies that change easily, mm. is that they have all reached a majority-minority milestone, which is the milestone that the U.S. will reach in around 2044, 2045. And that is when the original nat or native uh, ethnic or, or, or religious group loses its numerical advantage to one or more minority groups. Hmm. And they have all gone through this. And what we see across all these places, Crystal, is that there are pivots that they can take towards coexistence or pivots that they can take towards conflict. And you see a mix of both. But the places that pivot towards coexistence are inspiring in the way that they are redefining who they are. They are focused, they're, they're not dropping their heritage, but they are re-understanding and broadening the understanding of the nation, right? And this goes back to what we were just ch ch chatting about with Latinos. Are we broadening the nation or are we broadening whiteness? Mm. And I think that's the real question for the United States. Can we broaden the civic understanding of who we are as a country? And that's when we can actually follow those coexisting countries well. well Which places did well? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I would say that the place that did the best is probably actually Hawaii. So Hawaii was, of course, its own country until the U.S. annexed it forcibly in 1893. And, and even at, at that point, it was already a majority-minority country. But Hawaiians were always actually very open to intermarriage. And so, and with a sort of shrinking native population uh, in terms of blood quantum, a native population shrinking, they began to open their minds about what actually constitutes being Kanaka, uh, what, what constitutes being Hawaiian. And that broadening was expedited when the U.S. took over, right? Because you have a sense of almost an external threat. And very harsh assimilation re uh, regime made Hawaiians actually realize that they were all kind of in and against U.S. assimilation. Now, we don't have the luxury of some kind of external enemy trying to take over our country right now. Um, and I was hopeful, actually, that the coronavirus pandemic would actually serve as a kind of external enemy that might you know, strengthen we our solidarity. But unfortunately, <laughs> yeah. that didn't come to pass. <clears throat> yeah. So whenever you say whiteness, what does that mean? Like in terms of assimilating whiteness, right? So, because like, what's wrong with a Tejano person identifying as white? I'm from Texas, so I'm very familiar with the border crossing, and I remember, you know, seeing that at the time and being like, yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense. And like you were saying, these people see themselves as legitimately part of the Texas identity in a way that a lot of people in the Northeast and their politics don't really get. So, what do you mean when you say that? assimilation is itself whiteness. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a great question. So whiteness itself has changed over the course of American history. Yeah, of so early in our history, of course, whiteness referred to being Anglo-British or maybe Anglo-Dutch, Northern yeah, European right. Protestant, right? And that broadened actually in really important ways that brought us to our contemporary understanding of who we understand as white, right? And of course, identity is always not just about how you feel, but how other people perceive you. Mm -hmm. And that has also changed over the course of American history. So in many ways, actually, the evolutionary nature of whiteness, the evolutionary nature of identity is in some ways a strength of the United States because we can actually conceive of our identity changing over time in a much more versatile way than maybe other states could. Um, on the other hand, 
Um, it's also problematic um, because it's so paradoxical. It creates contradictions in who we think we are. Um, you know, if we take a look to, at our country right now through a 19th century lens, right, that white pro Northern sure. European Protestant lens, um, we're already a majority minority yeah, country. Right. You wouldn't include Greeks or Slavs or Jews or Italians or maybe even the Irish because of their Catholicism into the old conception of whiteness. And yet that has evolved over time. Yeah. And so I think that that is the sort of flexibility of identity. But the worst part of this is that that flexibility we allowed the country by bringing in new people into the understanding of whiteness, it actually per, uh, led to the persistence of the subjugation mm. of people of color. So sure. people who were deemed too dark to be white or too different to be white. And that's what's so problematic. We wanna create a civic identity that is not hinged on any kind of phenotypical appearance or any kind of race or religious background. We wanna create one that is all about the civic identity of who it means to America. That America is an idea, a project that we are all contributing to. Do you think that because of some of our American mythology, we might have a leg up on other countries in doing this? Because as you know, much as we fall short and as much as there are constant contradictions in all of this, we do have this notion of America as a country of immigrants and people of all races and colors and creeds coming together in this belief in the American ideal. Does that give us some sort of like, you know, cultural propaganda advantage in being able to pull this off? Absolutely. I'm, I'm actually an optimist about this. There's so much to be pessimistic about our social affairs, our, our, the strength of our social fabric right now. But America has a number of structural advantages to who we are. It's not like immigration has just suddenly happened in our history over the last 20 years, and this is a shock to the system. That is what happened in a lot of the other countries that I studied. We're different. We've been receiving immigrants since our you know conception, mm -hmm. right? Um, second, Intermarriage is growing and mixed race children is growing threefold in the last 10 years, wow. according to the US Census Bureau. It's remarkable. What that does is it blurs our identities, right? It means that it's harder to divide us over ethnicity or race or religion because more people are of mixed backgrounds. So you can't just you know, say that you know, there are hard lines between us when people are embodying the transcendence of those differences. And so these are structural advantages alongside the sort of evolving and, and, and uh, flexible nature of American identity. Yeah. And so we have a lot of attributes that we can leverage in that direction. Um, on the at the same time, we have a lot of fear mongers who are actually trying to leverage those differences against us. And I think that's what's so worrisome. And so I think that the United States is at a crossroads right now. And whether we pivot towards coexistence or pivot towards conflict depends on what we as people understand what we are, and what our leaders actually pursue. Yeah, I'm mostly an optimist on this question too. Uh, it's been great talking to you, Justin. Appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna have a link down in the description to the book. Go ahead and check it out and we'll see you guys later. Great to have you, Justin. Thank you. Pleasure, guys. Thanks. Hey guys, we're gonna be totally upfront with you. This is the most perilous time that we have ever operated in. It is so difficult just to try to sort through the news, but even more importantly, to bring you accurate information as this wave of lockdown and censorship spreads across the nation. Yeah, look, if you can become a premium subscriber today at breakingpoints.com, you're gonna help us build out a vibrant, independent media ecosystem, which is free of mainstream pressure. We can't tell you how important that is at a time like this. Yep, that's right. Go to breakingpoints.com to subscribe. We love you guys and we appreciate you so much.